Listen, I'm not going to put JBL and the Blue Meanie on this list. I can't talk about that one moment in wrestling history anymore. You can't make me. So, wrestling. The awful business we all like. When it works the way it's supposed to, it's a beautiful dance between two ambassadors of flesh, Da Vinci's of destruction, Vince's princes of big nerve pinches, seemingly horrible violence mitigated by cooperation, wrestlers having each other's backs with systems in place to make sure that no one hurts themselves for super realsies. Of course, sometimes accidents happen and people get injured, and that's obvious bad, but sometimes, thankfully a much rarer sometimes, those injuries aren't an accident. They were all part of a diabolical plan. Strap in, let's talk about some of the worst moments of utter unprofessional dick-headedness. Here are 10 wrestlers who tried to injure their opponents. Number 10, Koji Katao. Starting with this lad, oofed way to ensure you'll never work in America. WWF was in Japan co-promoting a show with Japanese promotion Super World of Sport. A match was booked between Earthquake, aka John Tenter, who'd previously been popular in Japan, against Koji Katao, so this match is super weird and a bit scary. It's not two lads twonking each other with patio furniture, instead it's a weird standoff occasionally broken by Katao trying to legit gouge Tenta's eyes. See, apparently Booker for SWS Great Kabuki had told Tenta to stiff Katao a little because of some personal animosity between the two. Katao loses his rag at this, stops wrestling entirely and just starts trying to blind the man sharing the ring with him before kicking a ref and proclaiming that wrestling was fake before getting immediately sacked. Way to go, good job. Number 9, Manny Fernandez. This one is really weird and kinda maybe graphic, but also perhaps a big work and also a hint of conspiracy revenge to it. So let's try and unpack it. So it's 1988 and this takes place in a match for Puerto Rican promotion World Wrestling Council. If that name and year sets off alarm bells for you and you're not sure why, that's because that's the year that Bruiser Brody was murdered backstage at a World Wrestling Council show, allegedly by Jose Gonzalez, aka Invader One, who attacked him with a knife in the showers. Now this match, apparently has Invader taking on Manny Fernandez in his Raging Bull persona. During the match, Fernandez hits Invader with a jumping knee to the midsection from the top rope, which apparently caused his stomach to rupture with blood spewing from his mouth. But then, Fernandez proceeds to hit Gonzalez with two further knee drops. Here is where it gets confusing. Some have maintained the whole thing was a work and that the blood was get this pig's blood mixed with vodka. However, some are adamant it was a shoot, with Fernandez himself swearing in later interviews that he intentionally injured Gonzalez as revenge for him allegedly killing Bruiser Brody until you dig deeper and you find out the match between Raging Bull and Invader happened two months before Brody was killed and that Raging Bull wrestled and injured not Invader 1 but Invader 3 who wasn't played by Gonzalez. What? It is such a mental story. Number 8. The Acolytes. Is there a company more welcoming to hot new talent than WWE? Come in, come in, say WWE. Take off your shoes, have a seat, make yourself comfortable. Here's a cookie. We've heard so much about you that we're gonna f***ing batter you for it. Give me back that cookie! Before the Dudleys became known as the Wizards of the Wicked Wood, that gimmick was actually synonymous with a different tag team, Public Enemy, who made brutal and often use of tables during their ECW days. In 1995, both WWF and WCW made offers for Public Enemy to sign with them, and they chose WCW. Big mistake, lads. When their three-year contract expired, they jumped ship to WWF in early 99, to which the locker room reacted with Mariah Carey's I Don't Know Her. So three bad things happened before Public Enemy vs. The Acolytes, one of the most infamous matches to take place in WWE history on an episode of Heat in March 99. Public Enemy had snubbed WWF in the past, they had been brought in by Terry Gordy, whom the Acolytes hated, and the Public Enemy tried to change the finish of the match at the last minute, not wanting to be put through tables so quickly into their win we're good at tables run. Oh dear, oh no. The Acolytes were instructed by management to make sure the finish happened and were otherwise given free reign to shoot all over Public Enemy. The rest is horror. Some of the chair shots Bradshaw hits, like, it's legit violence. They're not just trying to hurt them, they're trying to run them out of the company. It's really gross and Public Enemy were indeed gone within a few weeks of this air quotes match. Number seven, Ad Santel. So this incident didn't happen during an official match but instead during a sparring session but it's still too damn interesting not to talk about. Way back in the early days of pro wrestling, we're talking turn of the 20th century here, Frank Gotch and George Hackenschmidt had one of the most talked about rivalries of the day, with Gotch winning their first encounter and the World Heavyweight Wrestling Championship, the first ever wrestling championship, despite Hackenschmidt alleging dirty tactics like excessive body oil over the rank scandal of it. Turns out wrestling hasn't really changed all that much. Years later, their rematch was set for 1911 and it was instantly a storm of controversy again. Hackenschmidt went into the match claiming to be fighting fit, but actually had a knee injury he received in training, which Gotch used to get the easy win. However, after the bout, a wrestler called Ad Santel told 
told Luthez that Frank Gotch's team had paid him $5,000, which would be equivalent to over half a million today, to injure Hackenschmidt during a sparring match and make it look like an accident. This all happened decades before promoters tried to get Iron Sheik to break Hulk Hogan's leg. Wrestling's always been just a stand-up industry. Number six, Daniel Puder. When you start work at a new company, it's important to make a good first impression. If I've learned anything from Daniel Puder's book, How to Succeed at Business, it's try and break the arm of your boss on day one. Step two is unclear, step three is profit. 2004 and the fourth season of Tough Enough, aka Who Can Get Their Boy Scouts Wrestling Badge Competition, Hello Tiny Miz. During a November episode of SmackDown, Kurt Angle was putting the new recruits through their paces, challenging one of them to a match during which the Tough Enough competitor actually had some of his ribs accidentally broken by Angle, so a nice scary start. Fab. Angle challenges the rest of them, a challenge accepted by MMA trained five head showcase Daniel Puder, who proceeded to snatch Kurt and Nakamura and refused to give. Angle scrambled to force a botched pin because according to Dave Meltzer, he would have been quote, in surgery if the hold had been applied for even a few seconds longer. As you can imagine, backstage were less than thrilled and Puder was punished with a prison yard beating in front of an audience of millions when locker room enforcers Guerrero, Benoit and Holly ruined him in a 2005 Royal Rumble. Sweet Jesus. Number five, Antonio Inoki. An all you can Antonio buffet now and the chinniest chin to ever chiru in the form of Japanese uber legend Antonio Inoki, the man who founded New Japan Pro Wrestling and booked himself to be its top star for decades, wrestling never changes. To be honest though, you're not exactly going to argue with him, are you? Because Antonio Inoki has been in a number of infamous shoot fights in his wrestling career and has a cast iron reputation of sending condolences to the families of those who don't comply. In 1976, he thought Akram Pahal won and when his opponent wouldn't comply with the match booking, Inoki locked him in a double wrist lock and just straight up broke his arm when he wouldn't tap. Slightly more famous is Inoki's match against Muhammad Ali, where he lay on his back for most of the match trying to injure Ali's knees with stiff strikes for being uncooperative during the match is build, and finally, his most infamous disciplining against the great Antonio. Oh dear. Oh my. For reasons both unknown and incomprehensible, during their match in 77, Great Antonio stopped selling Inoki's offense. So Inoki simply said, okay then, flipped his internal switch from kayfabe to real life before knocking Antonio to the mat and repeatedly kicking him about the body and face until he was a bloody mess. Number four, Akira Maeda. Sticking with New Japan and their hair trigger shoot lunatics, let's talk about another man liable to see red and make red, Akira Maeda. Much like his boss Inoki, Maeda has a handful of wrestling matches gone wrong under his belt. One saw him take on Andre the Giant. Story has it that Andre had been instructed by Inoki himself to discipline the hot-headed Maeda, so when the Giant stopped cooperating, Maeda got furious and repeatedly went after Andre's legs until, unable to stand the pain any longer, the Giant laid down and demanded to be pinned. Maeda is no joke, but yet even more brutal than that was a six-man tag match, pitting Maeda with partners versus a team including Ricky Choshu. This match also fell apart when, apparently incensed at Ricky Choshu big-leaguing him, Maeda kicked him full in the face while he was applying a submission on another wrestler. A total shoot, the kick broke two orbital bones in Choshu's face, and remarkably, he didn't even fall. What did happen next was a match being completely abandoned, as both men had to be separated by their partners, trying to stop them coming to blows again. Damn Japan, you scary. Number three, Yoshiko. Damn Japan, you scary. As much as we like to have fun here in these wrestle talk lists, this one is just straight up no fun. We're talking about a match in February 2015 that's so infamous that it's referred to in Japanese wrestling as the Saison Matchy or the ghastly match. When you consider the horrors of Japanese death matches, that is f***ing saying something. The match saw Akio Zakawa taking on World of Stardom champion Yoshiko. The two stars had heat prior to the match, with Act having accidentally bloodied Yoshiko in a past match who was also a hot and up-and-coming young star. It's difficult to pinpoint exactly what happened as no one wants to talk about this match, but it's believed that Act accidentally hit Yoshiko with a closed fist and Yoshiko just went insane, shooting on Act so much she broke her cheek, nasal and orbital bones before the match was mercifully called off in under eight minutes. Awful, awful stuff. Yoshiko was stripped of her championship before briefly retiring. She's still wrestling today, fun fact for you all, whereas Act is now retired from the industry. The darkest point in stardom's history, one that saw one of the company's founders, Nane Takahashi, actually stepping down, but it still didn't draw quite as much press as this next entry. Number two, Sexy Star. If you're going to shoot on a fellow wrestler and intentionally try and injure them, doing it on pay-per-view during the promotion's biggest show of the year 
isn't smart, but care and consideration don't seem to be words in Sexy Star's vocabulary. At AAA's annual Triple Mania show in 2017, a fatal four-way was held for Sexy Star's Queen of Queens Championship. Also in that match was Rosemary, one of Impact Wrestling's most recognisable stars. During the match, something bad happens. It's unclear when, but at some point, Sexy Star gets tagged for real, and she completely loses composure, locking Rosemary in a shoot armbar, wrenching her shoulder out of its joint. Then after Rosemary has tapped out and broken free of the hold, Star grabs her arm again and locks the armbar in one more time. Wrestlers and fans alike around the world were outraged, with Road Dog calling for her to be blacklisted and Cody Rhodes saying that she'd never set foot in one of his locker rooms. Being banned from the two biggest promotions in America is smart going. And number one, JBL beats up the blue. I'm not doing it. Number one, New Jack, because he has admitted to trying to kill another man in a wrestling match. Like, he admitted to it. New Jack has made a solid case on numerous occasions for being the worst person in the wrestling biz. Mass transit incident, Gypsy Joe incident, but this one is his horrible, gross, dickhead masterpiece. During an ECW pay-per-view in Danbury, New Jack was wrestling Vic Grimes in a scaffold match. Miscommunication happened between the two, leading to the infamous Danbury Fall, where both men clattered to the concrete with Grimes accidentally landing on Jack's head, nearly killing him. New Jack holds grudges, turns out, and when some very dumb promoter for extreme pro wrestling decided to capitalize on that controversy by booking a feud culminating in another scaffold match between the two, Jack went in with evil on his mind. The story goes, and remember this is New Jack himself saying it, that at the top of the structure, New Jack legit tased Grimes before throwing him from the scaffold. New Jack claims that his aim was for Grimes to land on the turnbuckle and die. But thankfully, he landed on the ring ropes instead, still suffering multiple injuries, but living to wrestle another day. Wrestling, everyone. The wonderful world of sports entertainment. Merry Christmas. And that's our list. I feel like we've gone too far with this one. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Subscribe to us before we're demonetized. Oh, oh no. Merry Christmas. Bye-bye. <laughs> and jam that jam.